Good morning, and welcome to our worship on this third Sunday of Easter. One of the themes that runs through our readings for today is the message of hope, a message which we so desperately need during uh, these troubling times that we are experiencing. And today we're going to be taking a look at our gospel reading for today. As we take a look at these two men walking on this road to Emmaus, uh, we're going to see there are two men who have little or no hope whatsoever. In fact, their hope uh, has been dashed. But Jesus appears to them, and he restores their hope. He restores their hope by turning them to the power of his rule in their hearts through the gospel message. And today, we want to be reminded that as we go through this life, we want to walk with Jesus to continue to be in that gospel message so that he then, as our king, will rule in our hearts and fill our hearts with hope, hope that does not disappoint us. With that in mind, we bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today, as we gather for worship, we thank you that we have this opportunity for reflection upon your word, that power of the gospel. We pray for rich measure of your spirit, so that in all we do, we bring glory only to your name. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, once again we come together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Let us draw near to him in worship and in praise, in our thoughts and in our prayers. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Upon the hill the cross now stands empty. Morning light breaks upon the tomb. As we come before our God and King, let us confess our sins. Lord God, I humbly come before you. I confess that I am sinful in thought, word, and deed. I daily fail to do what you command and continually do what you forbid. Lord, I am sorry for my sins. I believe that for the sake of my Lord Jesus Christ, you will have mercy on me. Upon this, your sincere confession, by Christ's command and authority, I assure you that your sins are all forgiven. The vacant cross and the empty grave are God's signs to you that he has accepted the sacrifice of his one and only son. Whoever believes this simple truth of Scripture has eternal life. The Lord is gracious and righteous. When I was in great need, he saved me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today we join in reading responsively Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May his face shine on us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May the people praise you, all of them. May the countries be glad and sing for joy because you rule the peoples with fairness and you guide the countries of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May the peoples praise you, all of them. The earth will yield its harvest. God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, 
Fill our hearts with joy and confidence so that with all boldness we may proclaim the story of your salvation among all peoples of the earth. To the praise of your great name, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture readings are the readings for the third Sunday of Easter, and during this uh, Easter season, our first lesson will come from the book of Acts, and today we continue in the Pentecost story, uh, which we began taking a look at last week. We turn then to the second chapter of the book of Acts. Our primary reading is verses 36 through 47. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Gentlemen, brothers, what should we do? Peter answered them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call. He testified solemnly with many other words, and was appealing to them, saying, Escape from this crooked generation." Those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added. They continued to hold firmly to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Awe came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and property and were distributing the proceeds according to what anyone needed. Day after day, with one mind, they were devoted to meeting in the temple area as they continued to break bread in their homes. They shared their food with glad and sincere hearts as they continued praising God and being viewed favorably by all the people. Day after day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here ends our reading from the book of Acts. For our second lesson, we turn to Peter's first epistle, the first chapter. Our reading begins with the 17th verse. In life, uh, as we make decisions about purchasing things, sometimes we discover that we do not have sufficient payment for what we want. When we think about our salvation, Peter reminds us that it wasn't with the things of this world that we were purchased from our sin, but with the precious blood of Christ. And because of that, we can be confident that the payment is sufficient. If you call on the Father who judges impartially according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, Not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Here ends our second lesson. We now turn to our gospel reading for today, which will serve as the basis for our meditation today. It comes from the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel. Our reading begins with verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing this, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? Saddened, they stopped. One of them named Cleopas answered him, 
Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked them. They replied, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only that, but besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, How foolish you are, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going to travel farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, since it is almost evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began giving it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road and while he was explaining the scriptures to us? They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together. They were saying, the Lord really has been raised. He has appeared to Simon. They themselves described what had happened along the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. Here ends our reading from the Gospels. We now join in making confession of our Christian faith in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now join in singing together hymn number 160, this joyous, joyful Easter tide. joyful Easter tide away with sin and sorrow my love the crucified has sprung to life this morrow had Christ who once was slain not first his three-day prison our faith had been in vain but now is christ arisen 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 
risen, but now is Christ our risen. Death's flood has lost its shell since Jesus crossed the river. Lover of souls from ill, my passing soul who once was slain now first is three day prison our faith had been in vain but now is Christ arisen 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 but now is Christ arisen my flesh in hope shall rest for a season slumber till Trump from east to west shall wake the dead in number at Christ who once was slain not burst his three day prison. Our faith had been in vain, but now is Christ arisen, 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 but now is Christ arisen. Today we want to take a look at the words again recorded for us in Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, verses 13 through 35. Uh, since we just read these words a moment ago, I want to refocus your attention by rereading verses 25 through 27. Jesus says to these two disciples, How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how blessed we are that your word has been preserved for us, that we have this opportunity to meditate upon it. As there are so many things in the world today that rob us of our hope, that depress us and bring us down. Today, remind us that in walking with your son every day in the gospel, he is the one who alone can fill us with true hope, a hope that never disappoints us. Let that hope be more firmly grounded in our hearts by the power of your spirit today as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. It's hopeless. When was the last time that you felt that way? Do you feel that way right now? When was the last time that you felt that your circumstances were such that there was no silver lining possible in your situation? When was the last time that you simply gave up and threw in the towel and felt as if all hope had been lost? It's hopeless. That's something that Abraham could have thought. God had called him at the age of 75 to leave his familiar surroundings and go to a place that God had not designated to him. See, Abraham was on a need-to-know basis. But God did tell him as he was calling him that he was going to give to Abraham a special gift by his grace. And that gift was is that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. The Savior was going to come from him. God was going to raise up a great nation from his seed, and through that nation, he would deliver the world from their sins. Yet things in the life of Abraham, from a worldly perspective, began to look hopeless. And the reason I say that is that Abraham continued to get older, wife obviously continued to get older they didn't have a child 
She was barren. No son, no heir. How could he be the father of many nations without this heir? So Abraham thought that he would take things into his own hands, and using a custom that was familiar at that time, he went and took one of Sarah's maidservants and had a child by her. But God quickly informed Abraham that this child was not his heir. He was not going to become the father of many nations through this son. It looks hopeless. But listen to the insight that the Apostle Paul gives to us concerning this situation in Romans. He says, In the presence of God, Abraham believed him who makes the dead alive and calls non-existing things so that they exist. Hoping beyond what he could expect, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. Just as he was told, this is how many your descendants will be. He did not weaken in faith, even though he considered his own body as good as dead, because he was about 100 years old, and even though he considered Sarah's womb to be dead. He did not waver in unbelief with respect to God's promise, because he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. From a physical perspective, a worldly perspective, everything looks hopeless here in the life of Abraham. But Abraham did not look at it from a worldly perspective. He put his focus on the promise of God. And Paul tells us that he did not waver in his faith. He believed that somehow God could take Sarah's womb, which was as good as dead, and bring it back to life, and from that womb, give him an heir. Today in our gospel reading... We see two men who are walking from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus. Two men who had lost hope. The only thing that they could see was a cross and a tomb. A tomb which in their minds still had the body of Jesus. They saw no future. They see Jesus as a disappointment. He had dashed their hopes on the rocks. They couldn't see anything positive about this situation. But all was not lost. And all was not hopeless. As they're walking along with long, sad faces on this road to Emmaus, along comes Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Jesus fills them with hope, true hope. Not wishful thinking, true and solid hope. And how does he do it? He does it through the means that he does in the lives of all of his people. The way in which he rules the hearts of his people and carries out that powerful working of his kingdom through the wonderful message of the gospel. Jesus restored hope in the hearts and minds of these two men by opening up to them the truths of scripture. As we live in these uncertain and threatening times that we are in currently, a time when Satan is just looking for the opportunities to rob us of any kind of hope in our lives, let us have our hopes today renewed on the basis of this wonderful Easter story. Let us today learn this wonderful truth. Walking with Jesus gives us hope. As the reading opens, who's missing? Well, obviously, Jesus is missing. These two men are walking together, but Jesus isn't walking with them at this particular time. And what effect does this have on them? Well, they're sad. They're downcast. They're walking along as if their world has come crumbling down and there's no hope whatsoever for the future. These two men are having a discussion. Luke tells us they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Now, we get deeper insight as to what that exact conversation was about after Jesus shows up. Because Jesus asked them, well, hey, what have you been talking about? Listen again to what they say. They say to Jesus, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. They replied, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only that, but besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. What we hear here is that they say to Jesus that they had lost hope. Their hope had increased before Jesus' death over time as they had seen the powerful things that Jesus was able to do. He was a prophet, they said, who was mighty. They saw the miracles. They saw the things that Jesus could do which other people could not do. But it wasn't just the miracles. It was the message. You recall that in the course of Jesus' ministry, people were amazed at him because he taught as one who had authority, taught in a way that no one else taught. These men had experienced that very same thing. And so as a result, their hopes, their hopes had increased. They had hoped that this was the one who was going to redeem them. But all of that hope had been lost. What were they left with? They were left with a dead Jesus. This man who was mighty, who was powerful, but for somehow it didn't appear as if he could save himself. And as a result, he ended up dying on a cross, and they ended up putting him in a tomb just like everybody else. Their hope was smashed. Their hope was crushed. Now, exactly what was the hope that they had in Jesus that was uh, so disappointing to them? Well, their hope had been much like We'll be experiencing a lot of Christianity today. They had seen Jesus as one who is going to redeem them, going to liberate them from the foreign oppression that they were experiencing, that their people had been experiencing since 586 B.C. The Jews had not been self-ruled. They had had to live under the sovereignty of another nation. And what they had come to see the kingdom of God as is this Messiah coming, and he was going to restore Jerusalem as this great and powerful center of the world. They were gonna, he was going to restore Israel to the state that it was under the rule of David. And when he did that, he was going to make their lives easy. He was going to feed them. They wouldn't have to work. They would have all of their needs taken care of. When Jesus fed those 5,000 miraculously with a small amount of food, you will recall that the people pursued him viciously. Why? They wanted to make him their bread king. They saw Jesus as the fulfillment of this misconception they had pertaining to the kingdom of God and what the Messiah would do. But now, these men saw Jesus as that disappointment. They saw the kingdom of God as nothing but a place and people who occupied this kingdom. And the end result was, is it led them to be disappointed and without any hope whatsoever. But this is not how the Bible uses the term kingdom of God. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about this kingdom of God. He said in 1 Corinthians, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. To the Romans, he wrote, For the kingdom of God does not consist of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not about earthly activity. What it is about is about the powerful working of God for the salvation of sinners. Jesus could not have been clearer about that when we read in John chapter 18, as he speaks to Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, did Jesus have the power and ability to accomplish their false notions about what the kingdom of God should be? Most definitely. He told Pilate that. He said, I could stop all of this. 
He made that clear in the garden when he was being arrested. When he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, hey, I'm the guy you're looking for. You recall they fell back. He could have stopped all of it, but he did not because this was not what the kingdom of God is about. When the Bible uses the term kingdom of God in relationship to our God, it's a designation for the kingly activity of Jesus Christ. It is a designation for the gracious creating and working and ruling of God through the power of the gospel message and on behalf of the advancement of the gospel message into the lives and hearts of people. So, when you take a look, for instance, at Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus is talking about the subject of worry, we have him saying this most powerful directive at the end of that, that discourse. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What is he saying to us? He's saying to us that our first and foremost striving in this life should be directed toward remaining under the powerful working of the Holy Spirit through the gospel message. We are to see that we remain under the righteousness that we have that comes from Jesus Christ in which God works within us toward the salvation of our souls. So what does Jesus do when he appears to these two men? First of all, he keeps his identity withheld from them. He doesn't want them to focus on the fact that he is alive. He wants to direct them to the place where the kingdom of God most definitely is spoken of and how the kingdom of God operates. He directs them to the kingdom of God as it is found in the powerful rule of God in the hearts of believers through the gospel. He says to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. See, what he wanted them to understand is, is that under their concept of the kingdom of God, all was lost. What he wants them to see is that when you understand the kingdom of God correctly, it's all hope. Because the kingdom of God was at work in the course of everything that happens here to Jesus. So he takes them back, beginning with Moses, and through all the prophets and explains it to them. He shows them how the prophets speak of this suffering servant, the one who is going to have to carry the sins of the entire world to the cross without complaint, that the wrath of God would be vented on his son. All the sacrifices pointed at. We think particularly of what the Jews were celebrating at the time of Jesus' death, that Passover. That Passover lamb was Jesus. All these things spoke to the fact that blood had to be shed to deliver mankind from their sin. That is where we recognize God's kingdom. That is to say, that ruling activity of God. Things weren't spinning out of control here. Everything was in control. God was controlling the events that were taking place. Jesus was in control during all of this, even though it appears as if his enemies were the one who were, ones who were in control. But Jesus wanted them to understand that as they were experiencing this difficult trial in their life, of experiencing this crucifixion of, their, of the one that they hoped would be their savior, he wanted them to understand that God was in control and God would continue to be in control in their lives and everything that they would experience. He wanted them to always have hope in all of their circumstances in life, understanding that God's gracious rule was at work and that there is no such thing as faith in life where things happen by accident, but that God was working out everything for their personal good and the good of all mankind and the good of the advancement of the gospel message. And you see, that's what he wants for us. He doesn't want us to go down the road of life relying upon our own thoughts, relying upon the thoughts of others, relying upon our own interpretation of the things that are taking place. He wants us to walk every step with him, and he wants us to go to that place where he rules in our hearts and minds and fills them with hope. And that is his precious gospel message. 
going back again to the trial of Jesus and what Jesus says to Pilate there in the circumstances where he, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And Jesus acknowledges that he's a king. Here's something else that Jesus says to Pilate. He says, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. You see, Jesus in his powerful rule in our hearts through his word, speaks the truth to us. We live in a day and age where we are bombarded by the media, bombarded by information, and it's questionable how much of this is even the truth. But when we turn to the scriptures, the one thing that you can always be sure of is everything that is spoken there is the truth. When I talk about this in my confirmation classes, I will uh, go up to somebody in the class and I'll start taking their Bible and I'll flip it to a page and I'll say, what do we know about everything that's found on this page? And they'll answer, it's true. And then I'll flip it again and I'll say, what about this page? And I do that a couple of times. And the point of it is, is that no matter where we turn in the scriptures, we know that we don't have to filter any of this. This is all the truth. The message of the truth straightens out our thoughts, straightens out our feelings, and it gives us the ability, the power, and the strength to persevere. And another thing that it gives to us is it gives us patience, which so many times we don't have in these circumstances. Writer to the Hebrews speaks of it this way. He said, faith is being sure about what we hope for, being convinced about things we do not see. So many times in the course of our lives, we use the word hope. And we use it in the sense that, well, it's wishful thinking. I hope this is going to happen. Children hope for a snow day, but they're often disappointed by what happens. The next morning, their mother wakes them up and says, hate to break it to you, but there's school today. This is not hope that is wishful thinking. This is hope that is solid and secure. It is certain. Walking with Jesus in his word always means that we can count on the fact that by the power of the Spirit working through this word, we are going to see gradual spiritual growth in our lives. G. Campbell Morgan, who is a British congregational minister, tells a story about having gone to a cemetery in Italy. And in this cemetery, there was one particular grave that caught his attention. The grave was covered by a solid marble slab. But coming out of the middle of this slab of marble was an oak tree. So the end result was is this strong piece of marble was broken. Broken by this tree that had grown up, between, grown up from underneath it. Now think about that. Today... If you can find an acorn, go find a rock or go to your driveway if it's made out of concrete and take that acorn and try to break that piece of concrete with an acorn. You can't do it. What you'll end up doing is destroying the acorn, right? But now take that acorn and put it underneath that concrete. And over time, it can grow. And it has the power and ability to break that concrete just like it did with this slab of marble. Able to break it like a match that you could just snap just like that. Bringing the gospel into our life and walking with Christ and letting him speak to us, letting his word rule in our hearts and our minds day after day changes things changes things it is a gradual process and through the power of that we become stronger not based upon our abilities not upon our thinking but upon the power of the gospel the power of our king who had the ability to break the bonds of death and come back to life again it can break any marble slab that you have in your life i don't care what it is it can change anything and it gives us hope in the midst of situations and circumstances in life that appear to be absolutely hopeless. All of this is because of what? He's been raised again. He's been raised from the dead. 
He is alive. And because he is alive, he walks with us. He fulfills that promise that he made to us, that he is with us always to the very end of the age. How blessed we are amongst all people in the world right now as we walk through this situation that we are experiencing together, that we know that we are not alone, that it all is not hopeless. But Christ is there directing everything for our good, for the good of the gospel message. In his rising from the dead, he broke the chains of sin, death, and the power of Satan. Satan does not have to rule our lives because Jesus has destroyed his power. His reign in our hearts and in our lives through the gospel is limitless. So let's not despair. But every day, let us keep the Lord before us. The hope of these two men were restored. It was restored as Jesus took them through the scriptures and showed them the powerful working of God in the gospel message. And their hope was furthered by the fact that they saw that Jesus was indeed very much alive. Don't walk this road of life alone. Walk with Jesus in his message of love and hope and be confident of this. He will safely escort us through any circumstances that we might experience this life. And when it is our time, he will escort us into that kingdom of glory. That place where we will have that same opportunity as these two men had to see him face to face. And that opportunity and that experience, well, that one will never come to an end. May Jesus, our great resurrected and ascended Lord who is our king who rules over everything in our best interest rule our hearts and minds with his peace and fill us with great hope amen may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus amen let us pray This morning, we go to the Lord on behalf of two couples in our congregation who have had the wonderful joy and privilege of uh, celebrating their anniversaries, um, one this past week and one this coming week. This morning, we go to the Lord on behalf of Ron and Evelyn Kegley, who will be celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary on the 28th, and on behalf of Rich and Joyce Klug, who are richly blessed in reaching the milestone of 70 years together. They had this privilege uh, of celebrating this wonderful uh, joy on the 22nd. We go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Triune God, as these couples celebrate their anniversaries, accept our heartfelt thanks for all the blessings they have received. As companions on the journey through life, they have loved, consoled, and supported each other. But most important, they have grown closer to you. By your grace, they have maintained a Christian home and raised their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. They have learned forgiveness and unconditional love from you. Your word has been a lamp to their feet and a light for their path. Keep them committed to each other and to you. Continue to supply their earthly needs according to your will. Give them joy in the years to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, 
we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus sanctify us and keep us from all evil. May Christ drive all hurtful things far from us and purify both our souls and bodies. May Christ bind us to himself by the bond of love, and may his peace abound in our hearts. Amen. Our service concludes today with hymn number 167. We sing verses 1 through 4. my sure defense and my Savior now is living knowing this my confidence rests upon the hope he's giving though the night of death be fraught Still with many an anxious thought Jesus, my Redeemer, lives I too one to life shall waken Endless joy my Savior gives Shall my courage then be Shaken, I shall fear, or could the head rise and leave his members dead? No, too closely I am bound unto him by hope forever. Face strong. And the rock has found, grasped it, and will leave it never. Even death now cannot part from its Lord, the trusting heart. I am flesh and must return unto dust whence I am taken. But by faith I now discern that from death I shall awaken with my Savior to abide and his glory at his side. Once again, good morning. Welcome to all of you. We're so happy that you were able to be with us this morning. Um, in our live stream. Um, again, a reminder that I do uh, create an abbreviated bulletin every week. I upload it to our website. Um, one of the things that has been happening um, in the course of these weeks is the fact that we do get special gifts in, um, and thanks to the Lord, and gifts that are given um, in memory uh, of individuals. I do list them in that bulletin that I do create, but um, I am keeping a separate document, and when the Lord allows us to come back together and worship in his house, I will print um, a sheet that will have all of those special gifts lift, listed on there, so um, just so that you are aware of that. I just, I just want to, we think about the message today and the message of hope, and 
Uh, all of us experience moments uh, during this uh, situation that we are experiencing um, where our hope is somewhat diminished um, and we find ourselves down. And it is important for us, uh, not only during this time, but through all times, to keep Christ uh, ever before us so that he rules powerfully in our hearts, in our minds, and dispels these moments of despair. And remember that God is giving us a special opportunity to witness. Um, I had the, the chance this week, I stopped somewhere uh, to pick something up, and um, in the discussion with the clerk, uh, it was, um, you know, I had, I just simply said to this woman, I said, we're all going to die. Uh, it, it, it's inevitable. Um, we're going to leave this world. And then I told her the most important thing that we can come to know is, is Jesus as our Savior uh, and the blessings that we have in him. And um, I didn't get a lot of feedback, but um, obviously it was an opportunity for her to hear um, what our real peace is found in. It's not found in governments. It's not found in modern medicine. It is found in Jesus Christ, who's the only one who had the ability to break the bonds of death and to remain alive for all eternity as our ruling uh, Lord and Savior. So grab those opportunities that you have, and may God bless you this week. Thank you.